Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let's all greet one another. You are not under the law, but you are under grace. With this, the title today is The Choice That Saves the Unity. Today, I'm meeting you through a video. And within my 37 years after establishing this church, it's the first time that I've, been, I've not been able to give a physical message to you for personal reasons. And within many denominations, it's actually very common for pastors to take a rest, especially after doing six or seven years of ministry. But for me, I've never taken like a sabbatical or like a year off. And it's my first time to take this personal leave, and you might be wondering why. So I had plans with my wife for our 50th wedding anniversary, but also our apartment building, the elevator is 20 years old, and they said that they have to have construction on the elevator. And so we would have to use the stairs for that month. And so we're on the 10th floor. And so my wife and I, we said we're too old for this. And so then we decided to take this leave this week to match that construction as well. And so the departure date um, was only available for a Saturday. And so I had to um, take a leave for this Sunday and to record this message. And so today's sermon title is The Choice That Saves the Unity. And I've made a choice that saves my family unity. So I hope you'll be able to understand. So God established two institutions himself. It's the family and the church. And in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And thus the family was established. And God also chose the people of Israel to be a royal priesthood to save humanity. So in Exodus chapter 19, we see that God made a covenant with the Israelites at Mount Sinai. And it states that the most important condition for being a royal priesthood is listening well to God's word and keeping his covenant. And it was that promise. So God emphasized that the Israelites' u unity must first be a covenant unity that fully follows his word. And that's why the tabernacle was built around the Ark of the Covenant, and later the temple was built. And this is what we now call the church. And also in Acts chapter 2, the Church of the New Testament started or was established with the coming of the Holy Spirit at Mark's upper room. So God did not intend for us who are saved to live our walk of faith alone. So he called us to become a unity in which we are used together to fulfill God's covenant. So our church right now is also undertaking a covenantal challenge by f forming our five unities. So the five unities are represented by the initials of Yewon. So the letter Y stands for young. So young signifies youth and vibrancy. So just like this youth and liveliness, the Yewon unity is a covenant unity filled with the life of the gospel. And what does E stand for? It stands for evangelism. The Yewon unity is a gospel unity that testifies only the gospel of the cross of Jesus Christ. 
And W stands for World Missions, indicating that the Yewon Church is a missions unity that is all in on actualizing the historical mission of the evangelization of 237 nations and 5,000 tribes. And the O stands for oneness, meaning that the entire Yewon Church is a oneness unity united by the gospel and missions. And lastly, N stands for next generation, indicating that Yewon Church is a remnant unity resp responsible for the next generation. So in this way, Yewon Church created these five unities and fulfills the mission of the courtyard of healing, the courtyard of children, and the courtyard of Gentiles. However, although it is absolutely rightful to form unity and be used to fulfill God's work, it is not easy to maintain this unity. Why is this? This is because our spiritual enemy, Satan the devil, will launch a full-scale attack to prevent us from becoming one. In today's passage, we see the disciples being deceived by such an attack of Satan, arguing among themselves on the street about who is the greatest. It says, who is the greatest? Do you know what Satan utilizes to attack us the most? It's the self-centered life of Genesis chapter 3. It plants arrogance, saying that you are the best. And that started from the Garden of Eden. And therefore, through those attacks of Satan, it prevents the unity from becoming one. Both the Korean church and the churches of the world are being deceived by this. I think no matter what denomination it is, even our own denomination, there is only our Yewon church that is fully oneness with each other through all the different committees. We are a church that speaks of nothing else but only saving lives and world evangelization. So may the Yewon unity really open its spiritual eyes and always make the choice that saves unity. A choice that saves unity. Not a choice that divides this unity, but think of what can I do to save this unity? So I bless you in the name of the Lord that there may be evidence of building a firm partisan of Christ through life-saving gospel choices, whether at home, at church, or wherever, wherever you are. And really look back and think, am I saving wherever I go? The first main point, the acts of service that saves lives. So today's passage is connected to the incident on the Mount of Transfiguration. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus speaks to his disciples about the crucifixion and resurrection for the first time since Peter's confession of faith. And he then says to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. However, in order to endure a life that carries the cross, it was necessary to see the glory of heaven. And so in order to give them the strength to overcome these various hardships and adversities that would come their way, Jesus took his disciples up to the Mount of Transfiguration to pray. So while praying on the Mount, Jesus was transformed into a glorious form. And so the divinity of Jesus was re revealed, and that's what the disciples saw. And later, after coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration and healing the demon-possessed child, Jesus speaks of the crucifixion and resurrection to the disciples for a second time. And so this is a time where it's nearly at the end of his public ministry. And so Jesus was preparing the disciples for the end of that public ministry. But the problem was that the disciples did not understand his words, and they were even afraid to ask. 
they couldn't understand and they didn't even have a heart to ask him what it was about. And there was a reason for this. Verse 33 reads, And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. So looking at these words, we can clearly see the disciples' spiritual state. Jesus repeatedly spoke of his atoning death on the cross and resurrection. But after seeing the glory of Jesus on the Mount of Trans Transfiguration, they only saw Jesus as an even more political Messiah. Although they were currently a colony of Rome, they thought that if Jesus went up to Jerusalem, we would be able to have freedom from Rome and he would be able to overthrow Rome and build a new kingdom. And they thought, what position can I take when this new kingdom is established? And they thought, who would take the higher position over one another? That's what they were fighting about. And even within the church, there are those who think similarly to these disciples. They are uninterested in proclaiming the gospel. They are not interested in the revival of the church or saving souls. They prioritize their interest in who is greater and who takes the lead. How much power do I have? That's all they're interested in. They are completely held up in that priority of interest. And when this happens, the church loses its reason for existence. And so we fight with one another and become divided. And there have been so many situations like this. And in fact, due to the influence of Confucian culture in our country, there is a sense of hierarchy that is deeply prevalent in people's minds. It's really only existent in our country. When we meet someone new, we ask them their age. When you go overseas, it's actually considered rude to ask their age. They don't ask, how old are you? It's rude. They don't even have any sort of mindset regarding age. They're just all friends. Whether you're 50, whether you're 10, if you connect, you're friends. Our country, it's a little bit different. We always look at the age. And then what do we look at? We look at where you're from, your hometown. And then later we think of education or what school you went to. So no matter what, there's this sense of hierarchy in our society. And so the sense of hierarchy was one of the biggest obstacles for missionaries who first came to Korea. And in particular, back then there was a lot of home visitations. And so the missionaries would be particularly puzzled during these home visitations. And it was not an apartment culture back then like it is now. And so it was an ondol culture. So when you entered a room, there were lower and upper sides. And so there were upper and lower seats. But when you opened the door and entered, there was no symbol to show which side was upper or lower. And so if you could not discern correctly and happened to sit on the upper seat, any prospects for evangelization would go down the drain that day. And so when new missionaries arrived in Korea, they were first taught how to distinguish between upper and lower seats. And verse 35 reads, And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Seeing the disciples arguing about who was the greatest, Jesus imparted a very important spiritual truth. We can see a stark contrast between the concept of greatness as understood by the disciples and the greatness taught by Jesus. So the disciples sought to claim the first position by any means, but Jesus emphasized that one must become the last of all and the servant of all. 
And so he then brought a child to help the disciples understand. Let's look at verse 36. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So Jesus taught that they must have a heart that can serve even a child who was symbolically the lowest and weakest in society at the time. And in fact, the true model of this kind of service is Jesus Christ himself. In Mark chapter 10, verse 35 and onwards, we see that even after the events in today's passage, the disciples clash once again. James and John asked to sit at Jesus' right and left in his in his glory. So when the other ten disciples hear this, they become enraged with James and John. And Jesus took them at that time, teaching them about the leadership of service. In verse 45, he concludes, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And in our church, we have many people who serve, but who, the people that I'm really grateful for every time are the people that are really serving in the car parks. And so the car parks, they're all really nicely organized for everyone to use, but they're also um, people outside managing traffic, often sweating a lot in the sun. And we also have people who serve by doing things like these flower arrangements. And so there are people that are doing these works that are not visible to our eyes. And so they really have the... the mindset that is focused on the really important things. Because often people want to do things that people can, other people can see and other people can acknowledge. But the faith that the Bible talks about, it's completely different. And we can see that through the word. Because it says here that Jesus came to serve himself. Not only that, he came to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to die for many people. So Jesus, who is God, personally came to this earth in the flesh. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, it states how lowly he came. It says, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. It's taking the form of a servant. And where was Jesus born? Simply put, he was born in, in, in where cows take their food. So uh, to that extent, he was born in such a lowly form. Not only that, to resolve life's fundamental problem that resulted from Genesis chapter 3, he humbled himself to the point of death on the cross where he had to be completely naked and yet to be on the cross as people whipped him and bit him to death, even though he is God himself. And so following that example of Jesus Christ, we must live a life of service that saves lives. And above all, the life of service that Jesus demonstrated was to liberate all humanity from the problem of Genesis chapter 3. From all curses, from original sin, he gave us freedom. By giving his life as a ransom for many, he completely changed the fate of humanity, which was separated from God, enslaved to Satan amidst sin and curses, and destined to eternal destruction. By 180 degrees, he completely changed our lives around. And we too must step into the place of life-saving. 
and these biblical acts of service. And that's what our church ministers are like. They serve all the believers of our church. And we also have our church officers. We have our elders and our And if there's no service, there's no way for people to return to God. And that is why we are unfolding the Start 10,000 2025 movement as a church. And in fact, as we carry out this movement, we will find that it is not easy to continue unless we have an attitude to serve like Jesus. It will be difficult because meeting someone can feel burdensome in itself. And despite our efforts to initiate meetings with long-term absentees or meetings with unbelievers, no matter how hard we try or how much we wait, we may face cold rejections and we may face harsh words. And sometimes people make promises to meet, but they don't turn up. Or sometimes we, you go to meet them and they pour water over you. And so it may be, seem fruitless. And yet as an evangelist, what we must do is persist. It's not about our pride as an evangelist. It's about continuing and persisting. And this is because we possess the attitude of life-saving service as demonstrated by Jesus. That's why we are able to do the Start 10,000 2025 movement. It is because we have a burning heart for each soul. Every time I see the names of the evangelists who lead newcomers to church each Sunday, I'm deeply moved and inspired. They are true models of service. It's the greatest model of service that you are able to lead one soul to God. And although their names are not recorded, they're the members of each team of three who work together to integrate long-term absentees and new members into worship. And so it's so precious. And leading one soul to God, that's a very difficult thing to do. And even if we look at our denomination, there aren't many churches that have more than 300 members. Even though there are so many people in the world and they've been doing ministry for many, many years. And that's why it's very difficult to bring one soul to church. And not only that, our church, we have specialized churches. And last week, I received a message from the shaman specialized church. And so they shared their forum about their shaman field. And they sent me some photos. And it was showing that they were breaking down and getting rid of the the idol uh, sanctuary of shamanism. And so they completely became a child of God by accepting Jesus Christ, and then they all went to have dinner together as they gave fellowship and forum. And so Deaconess Kim really continuously tried so hard with that ministry and with that person. So what are the churches there where they go and find shamans and they try to give the gospel to them? And they get rid of their, that, that their shaman temples. There's no other church like that. Verse 41 of today's passage reads, reads, For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. It says, will by no means lose his reward. Even if it is only a cup of water that you give, you will not lose that reward. And this means that there is a heavenly reward for everything done for evangelism. 
전도를 위한 모든 것이 뭐요? 하나님의 상급이다. And for me, I am personally experiencing that every single week. I'm really filled with thanksgiving every day. I don't do it as a formality. And even recently, there was a retreat for ministers, and they said that they wanted to gather a large amount of money for church establishment. And for me as well, I thought that's an opportunity to receive reward from God. I shouldn't do it as a formality and just give a little bit, but I really need to see it as an opportunity to receive a reward and really do it with sincerity. And I really, every single moment of my life, I live like that before God. And I really, truly experience God is with me, God is protecting me, and God is blessing me. That's what the walk of faith is about. So I bless all the members of Year One Church in the name of the Lord that there may be evidence of receiving and enjoying the rewards of an evangelist through a life that has life-saving acts of service. The second main point, the biblical unity mindset. Verse 38 reads, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. John and the other di disciples felt that they were following Jesus in person and therefore were the only true followers of Jesus. And they thought that it was not proper for anyone other than them to cast out the demons in Jesus' name. So they tell Jesus that they told the others not to use the name of Jesus. And so Jesus spoke on behalf of the disciples, thinking they might receive a compliment from Jesus since they had only been scolded by him thus far. However, Jesus' response was very different from what the disciples expected. Verse 39 reads, Do not stop him, for on one who does not a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me, for the one who is not against us is for us. Jesus is saying that it does not matter what church or organization we belong to. As long as we belong to Jesus and do everything in Jesus' name, nothing becomes a problem. As long as we do it in the name of Jesus. It means that heresies who deny the truth of the Bible or Jesus Christ are unacceptable, but everything else should be tolerated and accepted. It's not about being envious or jealous of one another. That's not the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Paul speaks to the church of Corinth, who divided themselves as followers of Paul, Apollos, Cephas, and Christ. And Paul says to them, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Was I, Paul, ever crucified on the cross for you? That's what he says. And so he strongly urges them to become one together as to not let the cross of Christ be in vain. Although John was humiliated, humiliated in today's passage, he was transformed from a son of thunder to an apostle of love. He becomes completely transformed. 
Not only John, but even Peter and all the disciples, before the Holy Spirit came upon them, they were not that different from an unbeliever, but after receiving the Holy Spirit, they were completely transformed. And a message that is emphasized over and over again in 1 John to to the third book of John is the message where it says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. So for us to be united as one, it is not just a matter of one-sided yielding. The core to have the core is to have the mind of Christ in each other, as Philippians chapter two, verse five states. When everyone looks at the three onlys, the true gospel unity life is bound to be fulfilled. And priest Taechondok said the following. The fellowship of members in the church was neglected due to Confucian influence. And as a result, in Korean, the letter church was written with a Chinese character meaning to teach. He argued that the char Chinese character, which means fellowship, should be used instead, instead now. And it makes sense. We should remember that the church is a unity where fellowship with the Lord and fellowship among the church members must be beautifully formed. And the perfect fellowship with the triune God and the fellowship of the early church mentioned in Acts 2 needs to be realistically fulfilled. We must be able to love one another and raise each other up and serve one another and acknowledge each other. We must be able to do that. It's all about helping one another. So I bless all the members of Yewon Church in the name of the Lord to stand as the main figure of the Start 10,000 2025 movement with a biblical unity mindset and keep what the Holy Spirit has united together as one. This is the conclusion. Martin Luther, who raised the banner of the religious reformation in the 16th century said, a Christian is both a free man and a servant to all. And it's a meaningful confession that we are free but a servant to all. We have become completely free from the power of sin and death through the gospel of Jesus Christ, atonement on the cross and his resurrection. We are completely free. You are free and I am free. Inside of Christ, we have all become freed. And the law of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. That's what it says. You are not under law or sins, but you are under grace. You are under the covenant. But it does not end here. We should now live as servants of all for the gospel that saves lives. You cannot give excuses and say, I tried to serve, but I really just can't. But with the heart of Christ, you must be able to embrace and understand and forgive. No matter how many times it may be, forgive and forgive again. Because we have to live as servants for all. And we must move to the place that saves lives and the church, the unity of the gospel, through the life of biblical acts of service that Jesus showed us himself. So I bless all believers of Yewon Church in the name of the Lord to become the greater individuals of the kingdom of God through life-saving biblical acts of service and choices that saves the unity. Let us pray. Living Father God, let our Yewon community become one that saves others, whether it is our workplace, our schools, our families, Please let us be able to serve and save, li save lives through that. We have been freed from all sin and curses and fate and destiny, and now we are living under grace. So please let us be able to love one another and have the mindset of a biblical unity so that no matter where we go and whoever we meet, we will be able to proclaim that Jesus is the Christ 
and will be able to save others in the field. We pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.